Oh, why don't we give it up for the guys? How great was that? Thank you, Brett and Andrew. So great to um, oh, so great to worship. Do you have enough room? Oh, I'm just gonna. I might just pop that one. No, I'm good. I'm good. Beautiful. Don't want to like, you know, knock over musical equipment. Um, oh, we just love being part of this community, isn't it beautiful? Thank you so much. We feel really blessed um, to be part of it. And thanks for the opportunity um, for sharing this morning. Well, have you ever watched a child look through um, a family photo album of the time before they were born? And they ask, where am I in these photos? How come there's no photos of me? And then they come to the pages of themselves as a baby <clears throat> and their face lights up. And finally, they're part of the family story. I'm gonna make a bold statement here, not necessarily a theological one, but an observation from my personal study. Apart from the gospel accounts of the birth, death, and resurrection of Jesus, Acts chapter 10 could well be one of the most important chapters in the whole of the Bible for those of us who are not born Jewish. And I'll come back to the reason for this later, so stay awake or you might miss the big reveal. So how good is this Scent series? Um, last week when I was working on my, on my message, incredibly the, the verse of the day that popped up on my phone was Isaiah 6, 8. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send and who will go for us? And I said, here I am, Lord, send me. I don't know about you, but I've prayed this prayer many times. Sometimes in retrospect, I wished I hadn't prayed it when he indeed sent me somewhere and I didn't like the assignment. So you've got to be careful what you pray for. Um, but honestly, you know, we're sent people who are on mission to reflect the love and the hope and the grace of Jesus wherever and whenever he sends us. We're not sent to judge, we're sent to love. And this series through the lens of the book of Acts gives us great insight as to how the Lord uh, would have us walk out this sentness, for want of a better word, and how to keep trusting him even in the midst of uncertainty. And this week we're looking at a monumental interaction between a Roman soldier named Cornelius and the Apostle Peter, which is located in Acts 10 and 11. And it's about being sent to the unlikely. So let's begin reading from verse 1 of chapter 10, and uh, I'm in the NLT. So in Caesarea there lived a Roman army officer named Cornelius, who was a captain of the Italian regiment. He was a devout, God-fearing man, and, was ev and as was everyone in his household. Uh, he gave generously to the poor and paid, prayed regularly to God. One afternoon, about three o'clock, he had a vision in which he saw an angel of God coming toward him. Cornelius, the angel said. Cornelius stared at him in terror. I mean, can you imagine? What is it, sir? He asked the angel. And the angel replied, your prayers and gifts to the poor have been received by God as an offering. Now send some men to Joppa and summon a man named Simon Peter. He's staying with Simon, a tanner who lives near the seashore. As soon as the angel was gone, Cornelius called two of his household servants and a devout soldier, one of his personal attendants. He told them what had happened and he sent them off to Joppa. Now Cornelius was a Roman captain, which meant that he would have been in charge of around 100 men. He was devout and he was God-fearing, but he didn't know Jesus. But the Romans, as well as the Greeks, um, each had many gods, but the text indicates that that uh, Cornelius had accepted Yahweh as the one true God, um, but he hadn't gone as far as converting to Judaism. Um, there's actually quite a resemblance between Cornelius and the Roman centurion mentioned in the Gospels in Luke and Matthew. Um, they were both devout Roman Gentile soldiers. Um, and remember, Jesus commended the faith um, of the, the centurion in the Gospels um, as greater than all that he had witnessed in Israel, which was, would have really stirred the pot. Jesus was always stirring the pot, right? Um, Jesus was calling a Gentile more faithful than any Jew. Uh, so in Acts 10, uh, we're told that Cornelius was a man who prayed uh, to God. And it's really interesting, the first time um, in those verses that we just read that prayed was mentioned, the Greek word actually meant that he, he made requests of God. 
Um, but the second time, the Greek word actually means that he was with God. He spent time with the Lord in his presence. So we know that Cornelius wasn't just calling on God in name only. He actually had a relationship with God. Cornelius is also a man of compassion who has a heart to help the poor and he regularly supplies their needs. And his spending time with the Lord and his care of the poor are two things that the angel acknowledges that the Lord has taken notice of. Interesting, hey? Just thinking about our tamarisk that's about to launch. The Lord takes notice of when we are caring for people in our community. In fact, it says the Lord receives them as a sacrificial offering. So don't ever think that a prayer or an act of compassion goes unnoticed by the Lord, no matter how small you might think that it is. Cornelius was praying at three o'clock in the afternoon, which was the usual time for afternoon prayers. Um, the evidence around the ancient text suggests that Cornelius' encounter was with an actual angel that made himself seen to Cornelius. He wasn't having a dream or an impression, but an encounter with a heavenly being. And uh, the event actually bears quite a resemblance to the birth announcement of Jesus, um, to Mary and Joseph, and also John the Baptist to Zechariah. And Cornelius was a man who was searching for something more on his spiritual journey, and God answered him in a powerful way. He was an ordinary man, but God was about to use him as a vessel in an extraordinary way. And it appears that Cornelius, from this text, responded very quickly to the angel's direction. He dispatched men within the hour, um, as it was a 10-hour journey by foot, about 35 miles to the town of Joppa, um, where, and they would have had to rest overnight before setting out again um, and arriving by midday. So suffice to say that Cornelius didn't waste any time in responding to God's call. In fact, as we'll see in the next section of the chapter, both Cornelius and Peter were quick to respond to God's divine command, even though they didn't know the exact reason for their coming together. So let's read on from verse 9. The next day, as Cornelius' messengers were nearing the town, Peter went up on the flat roof to pray. It was about noon and he was hungry. But while a meal was being prepared, he fell into a trance. He saw the sky open and something like a large sheet was let down by its four corners. In the sheet were all sorts of animals, reptiles and birds. Then a voice said to him, get up, Peter, kill and eat them. No, Lord, Peter declared. I've never eaten anything that our Jewish laws have declared impure and unclean. But the voice spoke again. Do not call something unclean if God has made it clean. The same vision was repeated three times. Then the sheep was suddenly pulled back up to heaven. Peter was very perplexed. What could this vision mean? Just then, the men sent by Cornelius found Simon's house. Standing outside the gate, they asked, a man, they asked if a man named Simon Peter was staying there. Meanwhile, as Peter was puzzling over the vision, the Holy Spirit said to him, Three men have come looking for you. Get up, go downstairs, and go with them without hesitation. Don't worry, because I've sent them. So Peter went down and said, I'm the man you're looking for. Why have you come? And they said, we're sent by Cornelius, a Roman officer. He's a devout and God-fearing man, well-respected by all the Jews. A holy angel instructed him to summon you to his house so that he can hear your message. So Peter invited the men to stay for the night. And the next day he went with them, accompanied by some of the brothers from Joppa. Now, it might seem a bit strange to us that Peter would head up to the roof of the house before lunch, uh, but that was a very common occurrence in first century Greco-Roman culture. Most of the houses were designed with flat roofs and people used it as a space to gather or to hang out, the washing, for instance. So you didn't need your Dunlop volleys and a ladder, you know, to get up onto the flat roof. This was kind of a normal thing. Unlike Cornelius's uh, experience of actually seeing an angel with his own eyes, Peter sees the sheep with the animals and the reptiles and the birds on it as a, a heavenly vision. It was what we'd describe as an open vision, more like a dream when you're awake. Um, and, and Peter also heard the Lord speaking to him. The, rep the repetition of Peter seeing the same thing three times is an indication of the importance of the message that God was communicating to him. And notice 
that, you know, when significant things happen between Peter and God, there's a bit of a pattern of threes, right? Peter denies Jesus three times. He's restored by Jesus three times. And now this vision comes to him three times. So this makes Peter sit up and notice. And notice. It's just incredible what the Lord is accomplishing here and how he's going about it. It's like God is placing pieces of a jigsaw puzzle together to reveal the big picture. It's like when we heard about um, Ananias going to Saul. The Lord was doing something in Saul's heart and having these conversations with Saul, later Paul, and then he was having the same conversations with Ananias sending him over to Straight Street. It's just incredible. It's It's a similar type of thing, but incredibly different as well so but just uh, i love how the lord is just preparing people in different spaces and places um, for his bigger picture about you know what he's about to accomplish so peter of course is a devout follower of jesus but he's also still a bit legalistic in the way that he hasn't let go of some of the jewish requirements of the mosaic law so in particular the Food laws created huge barriers between Jews and Gentiles. Holiness was tied to cleanliness, and you could only be clean um, if you were a God-fearing Jew who obeyed all of the requirements of the law, including the food laws. But God was about to blow this mindset out of the water. He commanded Peter that what God called clean could not be called unclean. On the sheet that was let down that he saw in this vision were animals that were considered both clean and unclean by the Jews. And Peter didn't understand what the vision meant, but while he was puzzling over it, the Holy Spirit tells him to head downstairs and meet some visitors at the front door. Don't you love that? Just just an aside here. It's like God gave him the vision. The Holy Spirit gives him the, like, the plan. Come on, go. He's, the Holy Spirit guides us, leads us. So standing in front of him were two Jews. These were Cornelius's household servants. And a Gentile wanted to come in. This was a major issue for Peter. I mean, you wouldn't think so, right? But this was a major issue for Peter because it was against Mosaic law for a Jew to have a Gentile in their home. Immediately, the vision started to make some sense to Peter. And he realized that God had called the Gentile clean, who was standing at his front door, right in front of him, along with the Jews, who were standing at his front door. So Peter invites them in, and they stay the night. But here's an interesting thing. Why was it Peter that the Lord revealed this to? So Peter would become one of the key leaders, if not the leader, of the early church in Jerusalem. Over the past few years, Peter's religious mindset had been challenged by Jesus on a number of occasions. A few weeks ago, Dave's message showed us how God was showing Peter um, and others the ever-increasing kingdom of God by pouring out the Holy Spirit on Samaritans of all people who were indirectly related to the Jews, but of course, kind of their sworn enemies. Dave had a cracker of a line in his message saying that God was challenging exclusionary mindsets He was offending people's minds to get to their hearts. Now, here's what I think is really interesting. In the previous chapter of Acts, we read about Saul's encounter on the road to Damascus with Jesus, and he was called by God to take the good news to the Gentiles, which is exactly what he did. Peter, on the other hand, was used by God to preach the good news to the Jews, which is why he mostly stayed in Jerusalem. Um, So why was it that Peter had this encounter about all people being acceptable and clean before God and worthy of receiving the good news of Jesus? Now, my revelation about this, and I do not claim to understand it all, is that God wanted to give Peter a kingdom perspective. Even though it was Paul who would minister to the Gentiles and Peter to the Jews, Peter, as the leader of the church, needed to have a deep revelation that God was no respecter of persons Um, and that the work of Jesus on the cross was for all humanity, not just the Jewish nation. So God wants us to be kingdom people. The story is still the same. He still, he wants us to be opening our thoughts, our mind. He wants us to be kingdom people. 
You know, we're all called to serve God in different ways. For many of you, your primary areas of ministry will be in your family, at your place of work or in your neighbourhood. With a kingdom perspective, we're open to accepting people as they are rather than arbitrarily discounting them because of their past or their culture or for any other reason. Now here, I love this passage. Here is something incredible. God had been preparing Peter for this moment. We have evidence of this because of where Peter was living. Now most of scripture finds him located, leading the church, in Jerusalem. But for this particular point in time, Peter was living in Joppa in the home of a tradie. And that tradie was a tanner named Simon. Now, tanners were considered ritually unclean because they worked with the skin of dead animals. In fact, their yards had to be outside of the city or the town walls So here was Peter living with a tanner. It actually said that the home was by the seaside. Now, you've got to be careful what you read. It sounds like, oh, isn't this lovely? Here was Peter. He was living with Simon the tanner by the seaside with a beautiful view of the ocean. Well, no, they were outside the city walls. The house would have stunk because it was full of the skins of dead animals. Um, So I love that Peter, a leader in the church, was staying with a guy who was marginalised. He was on the outer. It speaks so much about the heart of Jesus for people. So by placing Peter at Simon's house, we know God was already working on Peter's heart leading up to this encounter with Cornelius. He was preparing Peter to understand a new truth, to widen yet again his understanding of God's kingdom. And like Peter, we need to remain open to what God is trying to teach us and challenge us on. I wonder if the Lord has kingdom positioned you somewhere or amongst certain people as preparation for you to understand a deeper truth about him. All right, so let's read on from verse 24. They arrived, so all of them, head down, they arrived in Caesarea the following day. Cornelius was waiting for them and had called together his relatives and close friends. As Peter entered his home, Cornelius fell at his feet and worshipped him. But Peter pulled him up and he said, stand up, I'm a human being just like you. So they talked together and went inside where many others were assembled. Peter told them, you know it's against our laws for a Jewish man to enter a Gentile home like this or to associate with you. But, but God, but God has shown me that I should no longer think of anyone as impure or unclean. So I came without objection as soon as I was sent for. Now, Tell me why you sent for me. He still doesn't know. Cornelius replied, four days ago, I was praying in my house about this same time. I'm just on to verse 33. So I sent for you at once and it was good for you to come. I love this this line. Now we are all here waiting for God, waiting before God to hear the message that the Lord has given you. Here we are and we still don't know why. Then Peter replied, I see very clearly this vision that he'd seen the day before is now really coming into focus. I see very clearly that God shows no favoritism. And Nicole was sharing with me before, this is what the kids are actually learning this morning, this verse. In every nation, God accepts those who fear him and do what is right. This is the message of good news for the people of Israel that there is peace with God through Jesus Christ, who is Lord of all. So as I said, the vision starts becoming even clearer to Peter as he arrives at the home of the Gentile Cornelius and goes inside, which was against the Jewish law. Peter would have never done this voluntarily, but God had intervened um, by sending him there. In fact, back in verse 20, the Lord had instructed Peter um, to go with the men and not to judge or discriminate. So they're all there. Jews and Gentiles extraordinarily gathered together by the Lord and now they're waiting for the big reveal. Why were they there? What was the mystery? Dave Lovell mentioned in his message a couple of weeks ago about our willingness to walk in the unknown for the search for daily revelation. I think both Cornelius and Peter were willing to walk in the unknown and that's our calling as well, to step out in faith and embrace the mystery 
We don't have to know it all. We want to, I want to, but that's part of our journey in following Jesus. So why were they all there at the house of Cornelius? Now, some scholars have suggested that the Ethiopian eunuch um, mentioned in Acts chapter 8 was the first Gentile convert, um, but others believe that he was, a, he was a Jewish by birth and he was actually um, in the service of Queen Candace um, of Ethiopia, and there were some other reasons as, as well. But, uh, but most people think that it was Cornelius who was actually the first Gentile convert and as we'll see later, certainly the first one to um, be baptised in the Holy Spirit. So either way, Acts 8 or Acts 10, we're in the, we're in the story, right? So um, Peter has the major revelation here that God shows no favouritism, that all of humanity is created in his image, which is really laid out in Genesis 127, like right at the beginning. Um, and let, so let's read on. We're going to skip the, to verse 44. Even as Peter was saying this, so what Peter's doing is he's, he's just sharing the good news, sharing the gospel. Even as Peter was saying these things, the Holy Spirit fell on all who were listening to the message. The Jewish believers who came with Peter were amazed that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles too. For they heard them speaking in other tongues and praising God. Then Peter asked, can anyone object to their being baptised now that they've received the Holy Spirit just as we did? So he gave orders for them to be baptised in the name of Jesus Christ. And afterwards, Cornelius asked him to stay with him for a few days. Now this has even been called by some the second Pentecost or the Gentile Pentecost, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit upon non-Jewish believers in Jesus. The supernatural act by God would have been a, a, a total revelation to Peter. His whole life had changed since he and those in the upper room had received the outpouring of the Spirit. He'd preached boldly, he'd seen thousands come to Jesus. The Spirit had empowered him to, to pray for people um, and see, see them healed so much so that we read in Acts 5 that um, people just placed sick people in the streets so that even Peter's shadow um, passing by um, might, might actually, because he just was so full of the Holy Spirit, they might be healed. In fact, even in the verses immediately before um, these, Peter had raised a woman named Tabitha um, from the dead in the name of Jesus. And this happened in Joppa, the town where he was staying with Simon the Tanner. So there was a lot of, in there were incredible things happening. Now, Jesus had specifically directed Peter and the other apostles to wait until the Holy Spirit had, had come and empowered them um, to go and preach the good news. And at that point, um, Peter had thought that the Spirit was just for the Jews. Then he realised it was also for the Samaritans. And now, with the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the Gentiles, this was direct confirmation from God that the good news of Jesus was for everyone. When Peter headed back to Jerusalem to tell the Jewish Christians the incredible news, their initial reaction wasn't actually to celebrate with him, but to nitpick and criticise him because he was, he'd eaten with uncircumcised men. Have you ever had some really exciting news to share with someone and they just like give you a critical response? It's kind of deflating, isn't it? Can you imagine how deflating this must have been for Peter? He's just had this incredible revelation from God. All the pieces of the jigsaw puzzle started. He's like, oh my gosh, it's blown my mind. He goes back and they're like, yeah, you ate with, you ate with dudes who are like uncircumcised. Peter would be like, oh my gosh. But anyway, he didn't give up. He just, he, he just, he just kept going. Um, he just explained to them, no, you don't understand. This is the direct work of God. And we go a little, fast forward a little bit to Acts 11, um, from verse 15 to 18. And he says, As I began to speak, the Holy Spirit came on them as he had come on us at the beginning, which is Peter's, Peter's there referring to the day of Pentecost. Then I remembered what the Lord had said, John baptised with water, but you will be baptised with the Holy Spirit. So if God gave them the same gift he gave us who believed in the Lord Jesus, who was I to think? that I could stand in God's way. 
And it says, when they heard this, they had no further objections. And they praised God, saying, so then, even to the Gentiles, God has granted repentance that leads to life. And the other point um, to make is that Cornelius and his family and friends, they were baptized in the Holy Spirit before they were actually water baptized. And this is exciting for me because this was my own experience. (laughs) Um, The usual order is that a new believer would be baptized in water um, and then in the Spirit. But of course, this doesn't discount the need to be baptized um, in water. But it gives us um, some clear evidence that God is sovereign and his timing is always perfect. His order is always perfect. He chose for the Spirit to fall on the Gentiles that day among people who were open to receiving from God. It was a, it was a direct, there was a, it wasn't as though these people just went, you know what, yeah, we heard your message, Peter. We believe in Jesus. No, like the power of the Holy Spirit fell on them. They started praising God, worshipping him, speaking in other tongues, just like it happened with the Jewish believers in the upper room on the day of Pentecost. And so there was like no doubt that God himself was in this. Um, I I love that, actually. Um, Yeah, so their hearts were ready, and he met them where they were at um, with his his power, which which I think is just so exciting. Did I actually say what the... I think I missed a paragraph. I'm just going to say this because, like, just in case you're like, I still don't quite know what the mystery is. But um, the mystery here wasn't... This is the exciting thing. It wasn't just that Gentiles could become Christians. It was that they could become Christians without first converting to Judaism. So this was a monumental shift in thinking. Up until now, the only Christians were Jewish Christians. If you wanted to be cut, like, does that make sense? But this, were, this was someone who wasn't born Jewish. They didn't convert to Judaism. They went direct from Gentile. And so that actually meant that for the first time ever, we were in the story. Like there was, there, there'd been, you know, all throughout the Old Testament, there was, there was talk, there was prophecy that one day, you know, the Gentiles will be part of God's family, not just exclusively for the Jewish people born Jewish. And here we see with the, with the conversion of Cornelius and his household and his family, Gentiles by birth, that actually is the first time that we appear in the family photo album. <laughs> this is pretty exciting. It's actually exciting stuff. Oh, I love it. I love it. So Acts chapter 10 contains the key encounter of Peter receiving the revelation that God calls all people clean through the saving blood of Christ. And accepting, in, in, in accepting this revelation, he went to the house of Cornelius where he and his household accepted Jesus as their Lord and Saviour and, as I said, became the first Gentile converts. Yeah, it's um, as God always does, you know, He used human contact and communication for this to come to pass in the natural. He needed a willing, he needed a willing Cornelius. He needed a willing Peter. It wasn't really about food. It was about people. It's always about relationships. What was already accomplished in the spirit manifested in the natural through the interaction between Peter and Cornelius. It's an incredible thing, isn't it, that the Lord has chosen ordinary people like you and I who are to be vessels of his grace and of his power. And just looking at Acts 9 and 10, we see two examples of this. While Saul was blinded by supernatural means and it was Jesus himself who appeared to him on the road to Damascus, the Lord used a human vessel in the, as I was saying before, in the form of Ananias to pray for Saul's healing and infilling of the Holy Spirit. Of course, you know, the Lord could have healed Saul and filled him with the Spirit himself without any human intervention, but that's not how he operates. His modus operandi is to use ordinary people like us to achieve extraordinary things on his behalf. And in Acts 10, we see both Cornelius and Peter being used by God to usher in a major 
turning point in world history. While it was only through Christ that the Gentiles or any person would be saved and adopted into the family of God, he chose for there to be an interaction between a Jew and a Gentile for this to be established. So we're going to share in communion, around the communion table um, in a moment, but just a couple of reflections for us to ponder while we're preparing our hearts to take communion together. Are we open to hear from God like Cornelius and Peter? Cornelius was a God-fearing man, but he hadn't yet been introduced to Jesus. Peter personally knew Jesus, but he still didn't have a full revelation that his kingdom would include all people. And both of these men were humble enough to trust God even when they didn't understand it all. When they were both challenged by God, they both responded straight away, even though they didn't have all the pieces of the jigsaw puzzle. Cornelius sent three servants on a 10-hour journey to invite Peter over for dinner, and Peter then agreed to break some of the most important religious laws that he knew to travel 10 hours to have dinner with a guy he'd never met and was considered unclean. How's God challenging us in our thinking right now to prepare us for future encounters where he wants to use us as the vessels of his love and his hope and his grace. Second thing to consider, who is our Cornelius? Who's the person or the people in your world right now that you think are the most unlikely to be the recipients of God's grace? Are there people or groups of people of a certain character or well, deep down, they're people that you don't think deserve the love and the grace of Jesus. As Jim Ryer writes in his book on acts and social justice, we're not called to be sin identifiers, but grace dispensers. I love that. We are called to dispense grace. What? That's so freeing, right? We don't, we're not called to judge, we're called to love, we're called to dispense his grace to the world around us. So as followers of Jesus, we're called to love all people and treat them with dignity and respect. And as the Lord commanded Peter, we're not to call anyone unholy or unclean. What would you do tomorrow if God sent you to shine the love of Jesus with someone who is incredibly, incredibly unlikely in your eyes or in my eyes to ever come to know him? I mean, the Lord might send you to Get along someone at your workplace or in your neighbourhood who, in your opinion, is very far from God and just love them well. Be there for them with no agenda except to be a vessel of God's love. He might ask you to pray for someone that you don't think deserves prayer. Will we pray anyway? He might send you to share the good news of Jesus with someone who you think is really unlikely to receive it. On this journey of following Jesus, it's highly likely that he will send us to unlikely people. We just need to have our radar up and notice them and listen to the leading of the Holy Spirit when we do meet them. And finally, what about personally for us? Are we open to God revealing more truth about his kingdom and character to us? Are we open and humble enough to recognise that some of our religious paradigms and traditions might need to be shifted a little bit? Even if we've been loyal followers of Jesus, as Peter was. In fact, I think that maybe the longer we've been following Jesus, the more we need to ask the question as to whether God wants to reveal more of his truth to us and shake us up a bit. So we might be willing but how do we make ourselves available and able to be shifted? In this passage that we've been looking at, I think it's vitally important for us to remember the posture of Peter that enabled God to give him this vision. Peter was up on the roof just before lunch. He was hungry, might have even been a bit hangry, but he was praying. Peter was spending time in the presence of the Lord and then came the earth-shattering download. 
So if we want to know more about God's word and his ways, we need to be with him. Abide in him, as Jesus describes in John 15. Be with him however that looks like for you. Might be in the surf, walking on a hiking trail, driving to work, sitting in silence at home. Whatever that looks like for you, let us consistently choose to be with him so that we open our hearts to be challenged by him and remember that he is so graceful and kind and loving towards us. Um, but we're on this journey together, right? We're on this journey together and we're on this journey together to encourage one another. So are we ready to be sent to the unlikely? So just invite Brett to come up, thank you, and invite you to, um, just with just pondering those thoughts, come and take some bread and some juice and maybe come back together and we'll, we'll share communion together to remember that Jesus laid down his life voluntarily for us. He rose again so that we could have life and life to the full and that he's coming back to restore all things to himself. But what a privilege that we can play a part in this upside down world of his kingdom that includes everyone. So just invite you to uh, take communion, thanks. so much. We're so grateful for who you are. We honour you. We thank you for the body of Jesus that was broken on our behalf, laid down so that we could live. Thank you for the blood that was poured out for us. Lord, and we just examine our hearts today and Show us, Lord, where you might be asking us to be open, to hear new truths about you. They're not new to you. <laughs> They're just, you're just revealing and showing more of yourself to us, Lord. Help us to have our radars up, Lord, for the people that you're bringing into our 
world across our path, that we can love with your love and your grace, Lord, without our agenda in the way, but, Lord, to be dispensers of your grace. We honour you and we thank you for sharing this holy meal together in Jesus' name. Amen.